Hello everyone and welcome to the Citizens Institute on Rural Design uh, first rural design webinar series on pre development and fundraising. Thanks so much for joining. Um, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design was established uh, by the National Endowment for the Arts in 1991 and it provides access to communities um, for resources and technical assistance they need to convert their good ideas into reality. With the support from a wide range of design, planning, and creative placemaking professionals, CIRD programs bring together local leaders from nonprofits, community organizations, and governments to help actionable solutions in the community's pressing design challenges and put the wheels in motion for a vision that can ultimately be in implemented. With this webinar series, we are hoping to provide training to rural communities around the country who are interested in design thinking and creative placemaking. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a leadership initiative of the NEA and with collaboration of the Housing Assistance Council and Building Community Workshop. The Housing Assistance Council, known as HAC, is a national nonprofit that focuses on rural communities across America through investment and assistance with affordable housing and community and economic development initiatives. BC Workshop is a nonprofit community design firm that works with communities across the country to elevate their strengths and help address their needs through design. Uh, my name is Evelyn Immonen. I'm one of the presenters for today. I work with the Citizens Institute on Rural Design here at the Housing Assistance Council. We have two other presenters that are joining us, um, Sean Evans um, with AOS Architects and Jennifer McAllister, who's the Development Manager at the Housing Assistance Council. Uh, we anticipate a 45 minute presentation followed by five to 10 minutes of Q&A. We'll go through some of what Citizens Institute on Rural Design is, um, an introduction to this webinar series, an overview of community planning and engagement, and then jump into the presentations from Sean Evans on historic preservation and the case studies there, and from Jennifer McAllister who will show um, the audience how to develop a fundraising strategy. Um, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar uh, in the chat box on your screen. So you just hit the question and answer icon at the top of the screen. First, I want to give you all a little background into what this webinar series is and how we'll be structuring it. So how did we choose the topics and the speakers for this webinar? Um, First, we did a survey of all the organizations that applied to the CERD program, um, and we found that there's interest in certain different kinds of design. CERD covers a lot of different areas. Um, some of them are listed on the screen, such as public spaces and trails, wayfinding, transportation, housing, um, and all sorts of arts and culture topics. Um, but we found that 11% of project applica applicants at CERD listed historic preservation as their primary application type, an additional 5% listed historic preservation as an additional project type. Um, so we wanted to include um, a historic preservation expert um, for the benefit of our constituents. We also conducted a survey that um, and found that a lot of respondents were interested in developing a fundraising strategy and learning more about funding opportunities. So beginning this month, CERD resource team members will lead a series of three webinars to help participants navigate the design process. Topics focus on fundraising and pre-development activities, design development and project management, and how to complete an action plan. Each webinar will feature subject matter experts and case studies showcasing success in rural design. The goal is to walk participants through a process of design challenge in their communities from the beginning to the end. The webinar can be used as a landmark for the community to advance their project. We'll send out a follow-up survey after this webinar for participants um, and we'd encourage to let you know how your community found this useful, what you're working on right now, and what you'd like to see in the next webinar. Um, so I find it helpful to keep in mind some of the learning objectives going into this and personalize these into your community specifically. Um, today we'll be considering the history of a project site and how this history can impact its future design and use. We'll be identifying and engaging with key players, communities, groups, and individuals who will play central roles in the timeline of the project. And finally, we'll be identifying goals and design challenges of the project and their relationship to future fundraising endeavors. 
Um, before I turn it over to the main speakers for today, I wanted to assemble kind of an overview uh, and uh, community planning 101 um, for those of you who are just getting started and hoping to engage with stakeholders in your community. Um, so you want to keep in mind that you have to be able to um, build a small team for any design project that you have. Um, start with just the people that you know and trust in the community. From there, you can broaden your search to additional partners um, wherever it is that you need to fill in the gaps. So think carefully about what groups aren't represented, what talent might you need, um, who has the access to resources, who has who knows the decision makers, and where the funding is. Um, you can really think big with some of these. Uh, you might want to think about bringing on partner specialists. So there's going to be some discrete parts of the project that you'll need to have more specialized skill sets. It's OK if not all partners are engaged as part of the core team, and it's important to know um, who can address a specific need or skill. Next, I see this all the time when interacting with new groups for the first time. What is your ask? You have to think of um, a reason that the partners that you're reaching out to want to participate and engage with your project. So before you ap approach a potential partner, you want to make sure that you research where they're coming from and be prepared to ask questions. Um, then you can come up with a few asks to show them what they are agreeing to contribute to and why they might want to be involved. So the goal should always be to create a shared vision for everyone that's working on your project. Um, it's also really key in the beginning to set up a clear project management structure so that everyone knows what their role is. I'd recommend a project management or leadership team of maybe three to five indiv committed individuals, those who are there at the start of the project whose ideas are kind of driving it and who are going to be most involved on a day-to-day -day basis in implementing the decisions. Um, so in this team, you might want to have somebody with the decision-making power. You might want to think of somebody um, is in charge of budgetary or financial knowledge, um, or maybe there should be somebody who's a point of contact or a face for the initiative to to other partners, um, but make sure that everyone on the team has a strong sense of the project vision. Um, I think it would be really useful for communities to then develop community advisory teams. Um, so this is going to be your largest group of partners. This is going to be a diverse stakeholder groups um, engaged with different community members and different groups out in the community. Um, and for this, you, this the goal of a community advisory team is to help build a communications network to get word out there about any asks that you might have. Um, and for these advisory team members to act as ambassadors to other groups um, like funders or decision makers or regional uh, interest groups. Finally, it might be important for you to establish a couple of task force or ask action teams. Um, these are groups of people that can work on a discrete task or a specific activity or plan um, for an event uh, or for an aspect of the project that you're putting together. Um, so all of these tips you can find um, on the CIRD website. Um, Another thing that I want to mention about community engagement is that it's so important to go back to your strategy if it's not working. Once you've done the initial outreach, once you've engaged certain partners, um, it's an iterative process from there. You're not stuck with just the people that you reached out to at first. A couple months down the line, um, as things change, uh, you want to reaffirm that and continue to ask important questions about who's involved. Um, it's all about testing your engagement strategy and then refining it from there. Um, another technique that I've found works really well if you're trying to get uh, on the ground community voices is feedback postcards. So if there's some kind of event that you're hosting um, for your project or that a, st a stakeholder or a partner is hosting um, that you can like work work with them and set up a booth about your aspect of the project. Um, if you, you can pass out little qu postcards with questions on the back of them and have community members fill them out. Um, so they can be things like, uh, where do you see this town in 10 years? Um, what do you think you remember most from Main Street? Um, or other questions about um, that help to build a shared community vision um, and get will get you some feedback from the ground. 
Um, there's another, a lot of wide varieties of opportunities for community engagement, way too many for me to go through here. Um, eventually you could work towards a charrette, you could do site visits with partners. Um, there's different types of civic engagement conversations that might need to happen. Uh, breakout groups, participatory budgeting, um, open houses. And a lot of these, again, a lot of these resources um, are on the CIRD website. There's a resource guide on public engagement from the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation that provides a really good matrix if anyone is curious about more ways of structuring outreach. Um, we also have the CIRD coordinators manual that has a community network analysis example in it. Um, this is an example that we're using right now in our Mount Zion Baptist Church um, team in Athens, Ohio. Um, they've been doing a series of pre-workshops pre with their community, um, building up to the design shred that we're hosting with them in June. So these are some real tips that are that will get you more community consensus and buy-in um, as you're working towards your design project. So now, thank you for listening to me. Um, we're about to transition to Sean Evans. He is the principal in charge of AOS's Santa Fe office and the director of preservation and cultural projects. He has led master plans for many large and complex historic communities, including the pueblos of Cochetti, OK, Owinge and Santo Domingo in New Mexico, um, Fort Apache in Arizona and Eastern State Penitentiary and the Penn Museum in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'll let Sean take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Evelyn. Let's see if this works. Okay. Oh, skipped ahead. Um, so I'm really excited to be here um, today. I've been a preservation architect for the last 25 years at our firm, AOS Architects. Uh, we're in Philadelphia and in Santa Fe. Um, I wanted to start with a quick kind of preservation 101. I think that's really important. Um, a lot of people um, have very specific ideas about preservation. One of the things that we find is that um, because there are so many laws and policies uh, that, that will uh, impact uh, your project, uh, depending on your funding, um, that is important to ground communities in Preservation 101. One of the things that I'm most excited about today's presentation is really is the is the idea of rural preservation and what that means because preservation really has urban roots. It's it, preservation came to be in the aftermath of World War One and World War II. Uh, the the orthodoxy of preservation philosophy grows out of a, a European, a very Western understanding of place and design and architecture, um, buildings that represent history, buildings that are monuments to speci very specific times, uh, and sadly, uh, most often, imp quote unquote, important white men. Buildings in urban communities are robust. They're made of brick and stone. And so the very premise of historic preservation, the very foundation of preservation approach uh, is different in rural communities. It's not going. It's getting, I'm, I'm sorry about this. So in rural uh, places, and I love when I when I give talks like this to use Google image search to kind of crowdsource uh, the intelligence of, of what um, what these ba very basic ideas of urban versus rural, and of course it's very um, full of stereotypes about red barns. Um, so I apologize for that, but I think it is important to distinguish urban and rural. So uh, rural places are really more about landscape uh, versus buildings. They're about culture uh, and tradition as opposed to history and architecture. Uh, there's a quality of intangible that's important, and by that uh, it's a, a relatively recent understanding in historic preservation um, that relates to uh, things that can't be touched, the, the direct translation, of course, um, where you're really worried less about buildings, but about ways of life. Rural buildings are often made of wood and earth, very different than the brick and stone of urban places. Uh, and so how we treat these as historic buildings, how we bring them into the future uh, requires a different understanding. I'll get this one of these days. 
Evelyn, you want to take control and just hit next when I say next. So when we work with communities on preservation, we start asking a lot of questions. Why do we preserve? And important there is the is who is we? This is not about us as architects. We really want to get into the understand the soul of the community and what's important to them, really diffuse the, the expertise uh, that we bring and, and let the voice of the community uh, take charge. What do we preserve? Do we even preserve? Is it a given that we preserve everything that is old, that is historic? And once we understand the answers to why and what, we can then formulate a process of how we preserve with the community next. So in the United States, historic preservation policy is governed by this document, which is called the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. The title go, goes on and on and on. This is um, really um, was produced out of in response to the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Uh, it's a document um, published by the National Park Service and really is a federal policy for how we treat historic buildings in the United States. Next. So the Secretary of the Interior Standards are, there are four different standards, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. And I'm sure we've all used these interchangeably, but they mean very different things to the National Park Service and to federal preservation protocol. So preservation is barely about extending the life of what remains. So really minimizing change absolutely as much as possible. Next, rehabilitation is about modernizing usage. This is about taking buildings that were designed for one purpose and making them into another purpose. It's also about, it also gives us guidance as to how to introduce new mechanical systems and new building systems into buildings next. And restoration and reconstruction are very similar, um, but they're about taking buildings back to a very specific moment in time, thinking about buildings like museum pieces, historic sites, um, which is, has a place but is is generally not um, what many communities are interested in next each of these approaches are based on physical integrity and objective authenticity the notion that certain times are more significant than others and the results in desire to limit change now, all of this uh, is very challenging in a rural environment next so one of the other Founding princ foundational principles in historic preservation is the idea of a, of a period of significance, which is a very academic way of understanding a place and its history. So I always like this example of uh, the $100 bill, which I really hate when I get one and I try not to have them in my wallet, but if you've ever seen one, it's Independence Hall on the back uh, in the very center of Philadelphia. So um, this is obviously the, the, this is the place where the, the Declaration of Independence and also the Constitution are signed. And there's obviously a very clear period of significance next, which is July 4th, 1776, when all these white dudes sat around and signed these really important documents, uh, which set the, the future of our country. So as a visitor, when you enter the Independence Hall, you're expecting to see the room as it existed on July 4th, 1776. It's, it, this is a place that is basically a museum. This is not how most of us like to have our historic places. We're balancing the past and the future and finding ourselves in the present next. So rural places are very challenging to, when we think about period of significance in historic preservation. This is the cabin that represents Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. And um, it there is a this, this is a this is a real place. Whether it was his actual uh, birthplace is a subject of debate. Next, it's preserved inside this kind of granite uh, mausoleum um, in order to um, minimize change. Next, and you see here on on the left. I'm glad I'm not the only one. There we go. Um, on the left is the building that surrounds. Um, the this uh, mythological cabin. On the right is a reconstructed cabin that seeks to represent uh, another era of Abraham Lincoln's life. And so we see these two very different approaches to preservation in rural communities. And this is really, again, based on the fact that these buildings are made of earth and mud and how, how do we keep them uh, standing? How do we uh, bring them into the future? Next. 
So in philosophy, there's a um, there's a there's a famous thought experiment that is called the paradox of Theseus's ship. Theseus was, of course, a Greek hero. He was the fellow that slayed the Minotaur, uh, and he and his uh, fellow Greek uh, sailors sailed uh, the Mediterranean uh, and the other seas of the area. Uh, and and Plato and many Greek philosophers uh, got into this argument about his ship. So after after a battle, the sh the ship uh, sat in the harbor uh, for a hundred years as a memorial to to Theseus and his adventures. Uh, and sitting in the water for a hundred years, the boards began to rot, and so they started replacing it. And within a hundred years, every single piece of fabric, every single piece of wood on the ship had been replaced. So is it the same ship is a philosophical question. We also have the, the and similar stories about my grandfather's ax um, seen above him. And you know, my dad replaced the handle um, and I replaced the head. So is it the same ax? Now in an urban environment, um, buildings are built to last longer. We don't have these same philosophical quandaries, but in rural environments, buildings are a little more fragile and they do get replaced piece by piece. Our federal preservation standards are not designed really well to deal with situations like this. And it's important that you as a rural community establish your own philosophy of how to bring your places into the future. Next. So ultimately, a lot what we find is that in rural places, we deal with a lot of reconstruction where we're rebuilding places um, because the materiality of these uh, structures uh, is so fragile. This is something that the Secretary of the Interior Standards discourages because it's based on the idea of historic buildings as monuments and the idea that the brick and the stone of these monuments conveys the memory of them generally the men who constructed them, the chisel marks on the on the stone convey the idea of the place and the history, uh, something that doesn't hold well in rural environments. Next. So there are some other um, federal guidelines that are much more helpful. Um, here we have the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Cultural Landscapes. And we hear more and more in, uh, in rural places and in dealing in the regulatory environment with the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service about cultural landscapes. And these aren't even necessarily a landscape. Buildings can be a cultural landscape. And the premise here is that a cultural landscape is uh, acknowledges uh, the need for historic places that aren't monuments uh, to change and evolve. Uh, and so there's a, there are there are starting to be many more um, really excellent technical guidances uh, from the from the government from various states about how to handle these things. Next, we also talk a lot about vernacular heritage uh, in the rural environment. So vernacular generally means buildings that weren't designed by architects, buildings that aren't monuments, buildings that grew out of very fundamental needs for buildings to be functional. And we think a lot about sustainability and the relationship between vernacular heritage and sustainability. There's some extraordinary guidance that starts to take us away from a monument based uh, approach to preservation. Next. And the National Trust for Historic Preservation has been doing extraordinary work uh, in preservation re getting it away from ideas about monuments and more towards people. Um, they're doing some extraordinary research into landscapes and heritage and how the how our processes have to be different. So this is a really great organization. Um, they do provide a lot of uh, really wonderful seed grants, not a lot of money, um, but very helpful places to start in development of rural based um, community engagement and preservation. Next. So now I'm going to quickly run through a couple case studies of our work uh, in rural environments. Um, we'll talk about three different communities. They, they are all tribal communities. Much of our work is in uh, with, with tribal nations and, and in historic preservation. And I think a lot of what we deal with uh, translates well to, to other rural communities. So we'll start with Fort Apache, um, which was a, a, a U.S. military installation that, that uh, started in the 1850s in, in rural Arizona uh, at the heart of the White Mountain Apache, what's now the White Mountain Apache Reservation. Next. So what we see here in these in many of these places is, is a real conflict 
between the European Anglo history of a place and the indigenous history of a place. When you look at these buildings up close, you see here on the left, the Commandant's house and on the right, the post office. These are buildings from the 1870s, 1880s and the very specific histories and significances that, that they have as buildings. When you step back as seen on the bottom picture, you can start to see the landscape, the cultural landscape that these buildings are set in. That these are surrounded by sacred mountains, um, which have a very different history. And so when we develop a community-based preservation pro approach, we have to understand both here, the foreground, literally the foreground and the background so that we can uh, deal with both the buildings and the landscape in ways that are appropriate to call local cultural values. Next. So here we see Fort Apache from the air, a very standard Western fort. Next. But when you keep backing out, um, you see that it is set within this majestic cultural landscape of rivers and mountains that have an ancient history um, and an ancient story. And when we even when we deal with the preservation of a building in this landscape, we really need to understand the totality of the place. Next. One of the exciting things about Fort Apache is that now this place um, of oppression is a place of healing where language and culture are being taught uh, to native uh, peoples uh, from around the country as well as the local Apache. Next. We've been working at the Pueblo of Oque Oingue, which is one of 19 Pueblos in New Mexico for the last 15 years on a really extraordinary preservation project that's fundamentally changed how we understand the practice of preservation. Next. So this is a community that is 800 years old in this place. Um, they've been living in this, in this very plaza uh, for that long. Um, this is the oldest photograph we have of the Pueblo from 1877. And it's really extraordinary because it captures in this oldest document we have extraordinary change. We know that when these homes were built uh, and rebuilt and taken down and rebuilt, um, that for many, many years they had no doors. You ascended a ladder to the roof of your home and down through a hatch. Now this very oldest photograph we have of the community captures the place in extraordinary change. Half of the homes no longer have ladders uh, and they have doors. And so it raises the question of preservation based on this idea of monuments. What was it originally? We don't know and the people of Okewinge aren't really that interested in. What they're interested in is having this place uh, suit both their ancient traditions and modern life as well. Next. So how do we do that? Well, we began uh, 15 years ago looking at the various buildings and we saw that there was about 60 homes remaining in the village and about half of them, um, as you see on the left, were set up for contemporary life, um, uh, contemporary windows, power lines, um, threading the sky like a spider web. Um, every, uh, appl every appliance and, and contemporary need, you can see they're watching SpongeBob SquarePants um, down below in this 500 year old house. And many of the houses um, falling into ruin, many of them haven't been entered in 50 years. So how do we bring these um, different places into the future? How do we make a place, um, current contemporary homes feel um, ancient and how do we make ancient homes feel modern? Where's that balance next? We started with a $7,500 grant, um, which has been leveraged again and again and again and to the point where we've now raised $11.5 million for this project. Uh, but with that initial $7,500 grant, we trained six high school kids um, to measure the buildings because we had very few documents. And they went home every night and talked to their parents and their grandparents about the, this ancient place and how it was going to be brought into the future. Our next grant was a $5,000 grant from a local philanthropic organization. And we developed an oral history program in which the elders walked the plazas uh, and told stories of their lives in the buildings, many of which had, most of the buildings had been abandoned when we started uh, because of HUD policies uh, that took people out of these traditional villages and set them in suburban style houses on 100 by 100 foot lots. Next. And we knew that we would have a, a, a very hard time with federal preservation standards. The village had been placed on the National Register in the 1970s. The blue box that you see here in this map uh, is the district, literally a box that the federal government drew around these people uh, as a historic place um, and to restrict change. Uh, the red shape 
uh, is the shape that that we we gave the elders a, a sharpie um, and looked at historic uh, photographs and aerial photographs and they drew the red shape to define the traditional village the very simple act but a powerful act to wrestle control away from the federal government and into local hands and local values next so one of the other early grants from the National Trust for Historic Preservation allowed us to build a database of historic images. So we found several hundred images of the plaza area. You've seen a few of them in the show so far. And um, we were able to identify the very specific vantage points um, that those cameras were, um, were in in 1877 and through, uh, through the contemporary days. So we were able to develop an architectural history of the modifications for each of these buildings. And as we reviewed these photographs with the community, we realized that this was not going to be a restoration project. They were not interested in returning it to the appearance that it had in 1877 or 1922 or whatever year. That what we've used the historic photographs for is to define an authentic and meaningful architectural vocabulary that represented the past, but also the future. Uh, for this place, that it was a way of them, again, wrestling control uh, and defining uh, defining the future of this ancient place. Next. So maybe someday the village will look as it does here on the, on the upper image, um, but this is not the design of an architect. What we've helped them develop is a process, a way of making this place living and organic again. The image on the bottom is a, is a fairly recent photograph of what what the plaza area looks like. You see the home that's been restored on the right, um, an addition on the second floor. Again, not the way that it ever once looked in the photograph, but according to traditional processes of rural life in this place. Next. And most importantly, we've actually restored the intangible traditions of the place. It's a restoration project, but not what's important is not the buildings, but it's about the public participation uh, that the children and the elders come together to mud plaster these homes every year um, and that the, the, the physical preservation work is done by the community itself, um, not contractors. Um, once, once the homes are, are rebuilt, uh, the community can, be, can, can keep this place and steward it into the future. So it is, ever, it is ever changing and not really a place of the past at all. It's a place of the future. Next. So one of the things we've been doing with other communities that's grown out of this work is giving them better control to understand how they're going to plan the future. This is the Pueblo of Zuni, which is in western New Mexico uh, near the Arizona border. Uh, this community is well over a thousand years old living in this place and they've struggled to understand it's the largest of the Pueblos in New Mexico, over 10,000 uh, tribal members. They've struggled to keep an understanding of how many homes are there? What condition are they in? Who's living in them? Where is there overcrowding? And how do we develop a preservation, uh, housing preservation approach, uh, approach to ensure that people are living safely? Next. So we've done a lot of work uh, with technology and have actually developed a mobile phone application for the community so that they can keep control of information of, uh, of the quality and condition and the quantity of the homes. Uh, on the reservation. And really what it's done is develop a tool for them to converse with each other about how they want to live, how they want to take this ancient place into the future. Next. So through the project, we trained three tribal members to, to use the technology um, and they inventoried almost 2000 homes uh, across the community. Um, and then we see, we, so we see them using, they were using iPads, so it can also be used on a phone, um, and some very uh, interesting maps that uh, populate the device uh, in real time as you go through and do the inventory. Next. And through this, we can generate uh, maps using GIS software, uh, geographic information systems, uh, which is related to, similar to GPS and GIS are, are related. Um, and so we were able to create these um, images of the community. This one happens to represent the exterior condition of the homes and is a way to give communities tools to talk about um, both the history and future of their place. Next. Um, and through the process of this, we developed uh, a four themed 
um, 16 point action plan to reform housing planning design construction and renovation uh, on the reservation next there are many tools like this we're using a, a subscription based platform called fulcrum um, but there are many other companies that are creating um, uh, innovative citizen based planning approaches uh, to develop uh, community based approach to gathering information so that you can understand uh, the relationship uh, in between preservation and development in your community. I believe that is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank John. you so much, Sean. Um, we are now going to transition to uh, Jennifer McAllister. She's the development manager at the Housing Assistance Council and has um, 15 years of experience raising funds and creating lasting partnerships for national nonprofits. Prior to joining HACC, she led neighbor work NeighborWorks America's Resource Development Division, overseeing its daily operations and managing national partnerships. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Evelyn. I am so excited to be here, and that is a really hard act to follow. I was just following everything that Sean said <laughs> very close. It was really great. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about fundraising, and I know that is something that often the idea of fundraising is scary to, to a lot of people, but it's a lot easier and it's not as it's really not as scary as it as it may seem. And I just want to one thing I want to say is that, you know, so much of what Evelyn shared under community building really applies to fundraising as well. You really have to think about how you're putting your team together. Do you have the right people um, to pull it off? What is your ask? And that's both of those volunteers and of of donors, you know, making sure that you are asking the right person for the right thing. Go back to your strategy. If it's not working, get that feedback from your donors, from those other folks that are your volunteers that are engaged in your activities. And there's also many kinds of engagement. So think about all of that as you're putting your strategy together. Um, let me see if I got the click thing. All right. All right. Fundraising 101. So first and foremost, you want to think about goal setting. What exactly are you trying to achieve? How are you going to measure that? And what do you need to raise to accomplish it? It's really important to think about the activity outcomes before you think about raising any dollars. You need to be able to explain what it is that you're trying to address. Um, and, and this is both the physical outcomes and even some of the more kind of intangible things. You know, how is that community connectedness growing? Um, is your project going to increase business opportunities? Um, things like that. Um, Sean addressed this a little bit too, and you also have to think about how you're going to measure that because donors do care. They want to know that their support mattered, that it made change in your community. This upfront work is really going to be key as you identify potential donors. Then in terms of dollars raised, be realistic about what you need. Um, maybe, you know, if you have a $100,000 goal, is all of that necessary to be in dollars and cash raised? Are there in-kind contributions that can contribute to that goal, whether it's professional services, um, you know, potentially maybe somebody who has a law background who can help you with some of the permitting or other kind of um, legal issues you may find? Is it, um, you know, food and beverages for any of your community meetings, things that you would otherwise have to pay out of pocket, but someone else could contribute. You have to think about all those kinds of things is when you put together that that dollars raised goal. Evelyn, I'm having some trouble skipping ahead of you. What am I? There we go. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. What do you so? When you're putting together your strategy and your your goals, what do you have already on hand to help you reach that goals? How to reach those goals? Um, so think about the human capital. You know who who can help you raise the funds. This is not necessarily about who's going to make the ask, but is there somebody that can help you draft materials, help you identify potential supporters? I mean, even driving somebody around to you know to community meetings. These are all important things, and 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 it's important to have those folks lined up. Um, social media and other communications tools. How are you getting your message out? Um, you want your community to be aware of of what is happening, what you're trying to achieve and and look at the kind of tools that you have on hand, whether it's your local radio station, if there's a TV station that does these kind of public 
and community interest stories, try and engage with, with those entities and help raise awareness for your project. Also think about the community events um, and the community institutions. So whether it's churches or if there are local fairs, perhaps they have an opportunity where you could ho ho um, have a booth or have other ways of getting the message out and, and interacting one on one with donors and raising that support. Next. So. Obviously, next, we want to think about, you know, who those donors are and the, who those donors are and how do you identify and connect with them? You have to think about who is passionate about your goal. So we want to think back to the outcomes that you've already identified and who cares about that. So. I first got started in fundraising when I was in, in when I was an undergraduate and I worked in the development office and one of my duties was entering the donations into the, the donor management system. And at the time, my school's football team is a division one school was terrible. I think one year that I was there, they won zero games <laughs> and yet I was processing all these donations for a football practice field. So somebody in the the athletic department's development team was able to cultivate and connect with those donors who cared about the football program, who knew that there was potential for this football pr program to once again, you know, be a success. And, you know, 15 late years later, it they were a success. They managed to be ranked a few years. The a former coach is now you know, going to be the new coach with the Carolina Panthers. So so those donations paid off that investment from those donors paid off. And so it's about connecting with somebody who cares about that same goal that you have. When it comes to individual donors, they can be the key to the success of what you're trying to to achieve. Um, you know, obviously there is the the donations that they can provide you, whether that be, you know, twenty five dollars, five hundred dollars. But they can also support you at community meetings. So if your project is up in front of a town council or a county council and you need your community to back you up and to show up and support, your donors should be one of the first groups that you go to to ask to, to join you in that support. Because obviously if they're committing their financial support, they care about making sure this, this project happens. Your individual donors can also help you with peer to peer fundraising. So I know we have all been asked whether it's on Facebook or just by email or in person, you know, a friend is running in some sort of race and they need to raise $500 to participate and they're asking you for $25. They can help connect you with their friends and their, um, you know, their peers and things like that and others who might be interested in supporting your cause. One note when it comes to to the individual donor, no donation is too small. When you ask someone for support, you're asking them to make a meaningful contribution. So for them, that might be five dollars. It might be ten dollars. It might be five hundred dollars. And we treat those donors all the same. They get the same recognition, the same support and the same thank you because they're giving of their whatever limited resources and we need to treat that equally. Um, because that's what when a donor feels loved and making a donor feel loved is is the most important thing. Another thing we can always ask our individual donors for again is that in kind expertise. So potentially, you know, if that is again the legal or if you have um, if you are looking to build a community garden, perhaps someone has some some landscaping design expertise, things like that. When it comes to corporate, local business and foundation, again, we're going to go back to what are those shared goals? I love this image and this kind of the sweet spot. The magic happens here because um, that's really how you connect with these kind of donors. Um, Sean's case study of the OK Wingay highlights how you can connect pieces of your project to something that a funder might want to support, like the photo project. That's not the entirety of that project, but it was an important element of the project and obviously aligned with that fund with that donor's um, interest. Um, look at the corporate so social responsibility goals for companies that are in or near your community. Um, so if someone has a headquarters there or some sort of presence, take a look at their website. Most companies, if not all, have some information around their community social responsibility goals. Um, they often do reports, they highlight their impact and and what the what they're striving to achieve with those goals. 
And so, you know, find out what they are, connect with either their communications person or marketing person, or if they actually have a CSR person and tell them about your story. Tell them about what it is that you're trying to achieve in your community. Um, local businesses obviously also care about a thriving community and many have marketing budgets or can provide in-kind support to help you support your goals. So for example, if you were going to do a, um, a silent auction to raise or some sort of auction to raise money for your project, um, restaurants especially are great um, businesses to solicit those kind of contributions for. They often have a marketing budget. It is, um, you know, obviously those dollars are going to be spent at their um, at their institution and raises very valuable dollars for your event or for your project. Uh, community foundations are an amazing asset for many communities across the country. Um, a lot of what they do is operate specific funds that they raise from local donors, and sometimes those are specific to um, scholarships or other kind of community benefit work. Um, so most, and that is all usually available on their website. Um, but one of the other things that they do is they manage what are called donor advised funds. And in those cases, a donor makes a donation to the community foundation, but the donor is able to dictate where those funds go and they often have a very close relationship with the program officer so getting to know the program officers at your community foundations talking about the project that you're trying to raise funds for um, can help that f program officer connect with a with with the donors that they're working with um, and then looking for other grant opportunities um, check out your local library. Many times they have a subscription to the foundation directory, which is a fantastic resource for looking up basically every foundation in the country. They peruse and go through all the data from their 990s and other things to look at where the grant opportunities are, what they fund. Um, and so you can do some research to look for those connections. Next. OK, so I know this, this this is the thing that scares everybody, and that is how to make the ask. Um, and I love this quote, and it's really kind of one of the, um, you know, key themes in fundraising. The things that we, you know, we always say is it's the five R's, you know, the right person asking the right prospect for the right project at the right time for the right amount. So think about who has the relationship. Does this donor care about your project? Why do they care about the, your project? Again, looking at those outcomes and those things that you're trying to achieve, what in it, what in there is the sweet spot for them? Is this in line with their giving? Um, and sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, but again, just kind of like with, with Sean said, you know, you have to be asking questions. That's, that's always the key is getting to know the donor, getting to know what they care about and figuring out how do you connect and what's, what that alignment is. Um, and again, I go back to the football example. The fundraiser from that, the athletic department was able to identify and cultivate those alumni donors who cared about the football program and was able to secure all of those donations. Again, so many donations I processed. <laughs> all right, next. All right, so stewardship is then the kind of, is one of the most important things when it comes to fundraising. So. What is stewardship and why does it matter? So stewardship is really all about maintaining that relationship. And as you can see by the image there, the thank you is the one of the biggest pieces of that. You should be thanking your donors soon and often after they make a gift. Um, if you can do a handwritten note, that's even better. But even if all you can get off is an email, that works too. You want to make sure that you are both acknowledging their contribution and acknowledging their commitment to your project. Um, it's also about stewardship is also about staying in communication with the donor about the impact of their support and the project. If they are an early in donor, you want to make sure that throughout the project you are providing updates on the status and um, the impact of the work. It's also oh, can you skip to the next one? It's also cheaper and more efficient to maintain existing donors and supporters than to bring in new donors. Um, as you can see from this quote from the Network for Good, it can cost between a quarter and a dollar fifty to raise just one dollar. So think about that as you are trying to, um, you know, identify donors and try to think about how are you going to keep them, and, and especially if you have a multi-year project, 
you want to make sure that you can go to them at least hopefully the next year and the following year um, than trying to find new donors. And then for funds with agreements, you know, obviously the corporate business foundation and, and government, you want to make sure if there's agreements in place that you are achieving, not just achieving, but hopefully exceeding what you've committed to in that agreement. Um, and that's all for me. And I just want to also note that this is really, you know, this is this fundraising strategy is really thinking in terms of if it's a small project, a capital campaign. Um, so it, this can work for any fundraising goal. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, and uh, at this point, we've reached our kind of Q&A section for uh, the webinar. Um, so at this point, if you see the Q&A icon in the uh, Microsoft Teams broadcast window, um, feel free to submit your question at any time. Um, I think we have one queued up right now, which is for Sean. Um, from the perspective of a local economic development planner, um, what kind of skills do you need to start the historic preservation process? And if you're not a designer or an architect or, or an architect, how would I get started? Um, Sean, are you on mute? How's that? You're good. OK, I had to unmute myself um, from a for a historic preservation project. One of the one of the most important things uh, to start with is is really understanding that the history of a place. And I kind of went through uh, that a little bit with with some of uh, the projects that I talked about. Of course, um, those are incredibly complex uh, places where um, that was very challenging. Um, many rural communities, it's not quite as challenging. Although it is, it is certainly a challenge um, to understand the history of a place. So I think you know, getting getting someone moving into research into the history of a place when something was built, um, spending time with, at your local library, the county historical society are always great places uh, to start to try to get as much of that kind of foundational history of of a place uh, as you can that will be important in fundraising and important in communicating um uh with 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 your stakeholders i think you know also um, taking advantage of some of these kind of citizen based place uh, inventory programs that i was talking about um gathering community understanding of, of not just the past but but the future what what are their goals um, those are the things uh, how something got to where it is the history of a place uh, and where a community wants to take it those are the two, those are the two most important things that an architect and a community planner need to help you uh, bring a place uh, into the future great thank you sean um uh please if anyone else has any other questions feel free to submit them in the chat box um we do have a question here for jennifer um uh there's an individual asking um, who should be responsible for grant stewardship if you're working with a small team, um, maybe an organization of only a few staff. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it, it's. I would say you want someone who is really intimate with the details of the project. I mean, obviously you want whoever is handling the financial background to, to play a role in terms of any financial reporting that is due. But if you're if you're trying to communicate and keep a, a donor in, involved and engaged, you really want that person who understands what is going on with the project. Great, yeah. Um, thank you for that answer. And we have another question for Sean. Um, this is coming from someone who has come across a lot of rural buildings, including courthouses, opera houses, and war memorials that are quite substantial. And that yeah. seems to um not aligned with your comments about rural preservation so what is there something that's missing there is there any other approach we should think about well obviously there are a mon monumental places uh in in rural communities uh where this the standard uh preservation approach outlined by the by the national park service and the secretary's standards is is absolutely valid uh, so in those in those kinds of places i, I would um, urge you to understand uh, those those foundational documents, the secretary's standards, um, as as the appropriate place to start, um, because those those kinds of places 
uh, were likely um, designed by architects that had very specific aesthetic intents, um, places that were designed to stand the test of time. And then in that case, obviously, the standard protocols and procedures should apply. Great, perfect. Um, if anyone has any last questions, please get them in at the moment. Um, I have one queued up right now that might be our last question, and this is for Jennifer. Um, this is uh, about what specifically rural communities should pitch to funders. Um, what are funders interested in um, for more remote areas that you've seen? So I think, I mean, sometimes, you know, funders do have geographic limitations. So that's the first thing you always want to pay attention to. But as long as you fit within their geographic um, requirement, you want to make sure that your language reflects how they talk about the issue. So, for example, we recently applied here at the Housing Assistance Council. We applied to a funder that doesn't typically, they don't typically fund a lot of rural organizations or, or work in rural communities. But one of the things that they talked about, they talk about a lot is equity. So in our proposal, we focused on how on the, that lack of investment in rural is an equity issue. And so that is how we tailored our, our proposal. So you want to make sure that, again, that your language reflects the language that they're using. So, you know, take a look at their website, read their annual reports, um, read things that their program officers or their leadership are putting out there because that will, a lot of times, will give you the key on how you connect with what they're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, we have a couple more questions coming in at this point, if we can um, keep going. Um, Sean, there's somebody asking for advice about um, a project that's upgrading rural low-end rentals into an LEED certified low-cost housing, but they recently lost their architect. Is there um, any advice that you'd share for a, a community in this position? Um. Wow. Um, well, I think um, hopefully hopefully you spoke with multiple architects at the beginning of the project um, and you can go back uh, to those other firms or other individuals that might already be familiar uh, with what you're doing. Uh, that would be my uh, first uh, advice. And then, you know, you should try to immediately, um, as soon as you can, get, get someone else involved. It sounds like a, a very challenging uh, project. Um, Balancing historic preservation and sustainability lead uh, is always a challenge, but it certainly can be done. And um, you'll want someone that has a track record uh, in both of those um, very technically challenging uh, criteria. Good luck. All right, it looks like we are just about running up on the end of our time here. Um, uh, Thank you guys for participating. Um, I hope that you guys all got something out of this. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to um, the Citizens Institute of on Rural Design online um, and look out for the next webinar. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you.